They say, the harder the work, the greater the reward. This is our life's work. Good morning. It is 9-10, Wednesday, June 1st. This is the TDN Writers' Room, presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the Associate Editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. And as this miracle run continues, boys, I only got three words and four syllables for you. Let's go, Rangers. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Bill Finley, a correspondent for Thoroughbred Daily News. I used to be a huge hockey fan. It dawned on me the other day. I think I can only name one guy in the NHL. Sidney Crosby, is he still around? Yeah, but we eliminated his ass. He's home now. Okay, that's it. But, man, um, anyways, uh, good luck to the Rangers, Joe. Thanks. Jonathan Green, general manager of DJ Stable. And for those of you who are eligible to vote for the Breeders' Cup board, um, I seriously suggest that you do log on, vote early, vote often. There's 25 of us. Oh, did I mention that I'm one of the 25 people who are running for the board? 25 of us, you get to vote for, for 20 of us. Um, and even if you don't vote for me, please vote early, often. And I approve of this message. It's super, super embarrassing if John doesn't get it when you get 20 out of 25 win. So, John, with all the stuff, you better get there. I better get there. That's exactly right. And, and you know, DJ Stable has six votes, six votes out of 20,000. So uh, I, I'm going to need some support and some help for sure. Yeah, we can. So if you like well, your dad, I heard your dad's going to vote against you, John. Oh, there's no the question. He's got taste and, yeah. and 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 credibility. He's definitely voting against me. He can, the worst thing that can happen is for John Green to be on the board of the Breeders' Cup and Len Green not. That would be that would be the ultimate uh, slap in the face. The TDN Writers' Room is brought to you by Keeneland. Make plans to attend the Keeneland September Yearling Sale beginning Monday, September 12th. You can learn more at theworldsyearlingsale.com. So there was some grade one r- racing over the weekend. We had three grade ones at Santa Anita. Unfortunately, as is the trend, we had a bunch of pretty snoozy five and six horse fields. Count Again did punch the first Breeders' Cup ticket in North America by winning the Shoemaker Mile. Got a 108 buyers. Horses become a kind of a star in the turf mile division as a seven-year-old ocean road won the grade one gamely the nice promising horse for brennan walsh there goes harvard upset the hollywood gold cup um for michael mccarthy and irad ortiz jr first grade one winner for will take charge as a stallion but honestly none of that really gets the pulse racing so we thought we'd talk to john this week because dj stable has had some very exciting two-year-olds debut in woodbine at woodbine the last couple of weekends not not just stay on our good side, who we had Skip on to talk about last week. They followed it up this week with a pair of blowout winners, 94 Expos, who love that name. DJ Stable, very good at naming horses. I, I would say that even if I didn't know, John. Those 94 Expos, if you don't know, the Montreal Expos, they were, they were going to be the best team in the league in 1994. They were running away with the pennant, except that was the year of the strike, the Major League Baseball strike. And so that was completely that, that was completely cut off their season, and they never, never quite got back to that. And eventually moved away and moved to to Washington to be the Nationals. So I love that name. Um, and the John, sorry, who's the third one? I, I slipped in my mind. Me, me, and my shadow. Me the violence. Me and my shadow. Yep, that's right. And and she looked great too. What what really survived a really torrid pace duel and ran away by four lengths. John, I don't remember this. Like, do you, do you guys always started your two-year-olds this early, or is this kind of a new thing that the stable is doing? This is a really new thing, Joe. It's probably about uh, about two years in the running right now. When we sat down with Mark Cassie three years ago and put together our game plan, um, one of the advantages that we thought we'd have with a guy like Mark Cassie is that he has his own training facility. So um, what we did was we started taking our horses out of the year when we bought them out of the yearling sales and just send them right down to Florida instead of having them get – you know, four, six, eight weeks in, in Kentucky, um, you know, out in the fields. And uh, because of that, Mark has kind of jump started how early these horses are running. And last year we had Lemieux who won, um, you know, in May and then went on to, uh, to big races. Uh, Helium also, you know, ran uh, early on in his career before June. And, and I think it just gives you a tremendous advantage if they're ready. Um, and not that we buy horses to run four and a half or five furlongs, but um, but if they're ready to run and Mark really doesn't crank on them that much, um, then then these are kind of paid breezes for for lack of a better term. And and uh, it's just been a wonderful run so far. And, and, you know, as much as we've won and everything like that, Mark Cassie has run 
in seven two-year-old races. He's got five wins and two thirds. And, and that's just an incredible, um, you know, percentage in, in the grand scheme of things. He's actually the leading trainer in two-year-old victories and win percentage right now. Um, so I give a lot of credit to, to Mark Cassie and, and also, you know, we've had Kim Valerio, uh, shortlist for us for the past couple of years. And she's been phenomenal about finding horses that have gone on to not only be ready early, but also gone on to, to run well, um, you know, as the distances get further. So right now, Knockwood, it, it's really coming together. John, take us to where all these horses are going to go from here. And I, I know you're looking at Saratoga. Yeah. So, so, uh, stay on a good side, um, is going to run in the Sanford, um, opening weekend at, at, uh, at Saratoga. Me and my shadow who posted a 76 buyer. Um, which, you know, for a two-year-old filly first time out, that was be pretty impressive. Um, she's going to go to the Schuyler Bell, um, which is a great at stake. Also, I think it's opening day at Saratoga. Um, and then 94 Expos um, is actually going to stay in Canada. Um, he's obviously Canadian bred, and he's going to run in the Victoria State um, that same weekend, but at, at Woodbine. So right now, you know, Knockwood, we're hitting on all cylinders. And, uh, you know, hopefully we're working backwards from the Breeders' Cup uh, races at Keeneland. You got a dream, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, why not? And yeah, shout out to Mark Cassie, who's obviously does, does, does a great job in Canada. But I, I agree that his two-year-old presence is starting to, to develop even more than it used to. And I think you, know, you guys are part of that. But none of these horses were huge auction buys. Now, and answer me this, John. Um, you guys have obviously spent a lot of money at the two-year-old sales. But then I, I feel like a lot of your successes happen with, with cheaper price horses, either um, at the basic October sale or Keeneland September, or do you think those horses are a little bit more more conducive to that early success? Whereas the two year olds, I feel like they're cranked on so much to get to those sales and get to those breezes that it seems like they need a little bit more time to start. Whereas these horses, you can kind of be with them for six months or so before they get running. Yeah, and, and Joe, it's an excellent point. But again, without giving away any company secrets, one of the things that we did from an analytics standpoint is looked at where graded stake winners come from. And certainly there's graded stake winners that come from every sale. I mean, literally every sale right down to the digital platform. Um, but what we found is for our program, we like to buy them as yearlings um, and get them into our uh, process and, and our program earlier and then uh, kind of work their way up. The two-year-old sales, it, it's such an asking um, to have these horses ready to run. And, and unfortunately, you know, they, they really have to be on the razor's edge from the, really from Christmas all the way until the sale. So these horses are already cranked on and, and, and you know, are, are peaking for these under tax shows. You have to give them a little bit of time uh, afterwards. So we've opted to go the route of buying more yearlings. It's not to say we, we don't buy two-year-olds, but the majority of what we buy are yearlings at a variety of sales. And like you said, we've, we've bought graded stake winners and stake winners and at, at the, you know, the phasic October sale and the Keeneland September sale and, um, and at the OBS uh, January sale and kind of everything in between, you have to kick up a, a lot of rocks to, to find these good horses. And we try to stay within a certain budget. So, you know, I'd love to be able to say, well, we just buy the best horse at every sale. It's impossible. It's impossible to do because there are so many well-heeled programs. And now some of these groups are partnering, partnering together. Um, so you can't buy the best bred horse anymore that, that looks the part. You have to look at other other options. And and not that these horses were, were inexpensive. I mean, 94 Expos was 80000 and um, and staying our good side was 85 and, and me and my shadow was 185,000, but we're not given half a million dollars to, to, to win, you know, in, in May, um, or to have a, you know, Derby or an Oaks candidate. And, and I think you have to be disciplined and you have to stay within, you know, within your, your budgetary confines. I was, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, sure. I want to, well, uh, tomorrow, not tomorrow, Friday at Churchill Downs, John, uh, you have another first time starter, a filly by the name of Wonder Wheel. He's by Into Mischief, and for an Into Mischief, relatively cheap, two hundred and seventy-five thousand. What, what do we know about this filly? Yeah, Wonder Wheel has, uh, you know, has really been the one of the top two horses that we have, we think, in our program. Um, and, and I know the bar is set kind of high this year, just because we're winning a lot of a lot of early races. Um, but here's a filly that we thought a lot of. Again, we went out of our comfort range as far as purchasing price. We we bought her for two seventy-five. Um, she's, you know, she's by a multiple great stake winning um, Tis Wonderful mare named Wonder Gal. And uh, we have very high expectations for her. Five and a half furlongs probably isn't her preferred distance. And there's certainly a lot of good horses in the race, it looks like. There's an American Pharaoh, there's a Curlin Philly, there's a Munnings. 
uh, Pioneer of the Nile that Norm Cassie has for three hundred thousand dollars. So there's a lot of well-bred horses coming into this race at Churchill Downs. Um, but I love the fact that she's training great and she's on the outside, which I really prefer for, for two year olds. I prefer that they don't stay in the gate for very long. And if they break a little step slow, that they have an opportunity to, to catch up on the outside. Um, and Tyler Gaffney riding us. So I, I feel like that we're we're in a good spot, but they're babies. So you just you just never know. Yeah, you know, one of the things that was interesting about the the horses at Woodbine is that they were all pretty heavily bet. So it seemed like they weren't a secret. I don't know if that's John or if that's Len or if that's Len having a big mouth and telling everybody about the horse. Um, but how do you like? I, I always wonder this with two year olds because they're so they're so early in their development. How do you really start to differentiate them this early on? Like I I feel like later on, like they're in Saratoga when they're all working in company and they're all coming around, it's a little bit easier to to stack them up against each other. But like this right. early, how do you figure out which are the better ones? Yeah. And and again, that's one of the advantages of 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 having a trainer like Mark Cassie. Mark had, and I'm probably not going to get this number right, but he had over 60 two-year-olds at his facility at any given time. So it's almost like he has his own group of two-year-olds that he can constantly stack up against each other and figure out, okay, this one's better here. This one, you know, needs more time. This one uh, needs more time in company. Uh, you know, so so in the hierarchy of things, when you're running against uh, in the mornings, when you're training against, uh, you know, the well-bred horses of Live Oak and the expensive, you know, yearlings and two-year-olds um, that Gary Barber and, and Tracy Farmer have, you have a pretty good idea um, based on on that group of where you are in the pecking order, and um, and it's not to say that 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 uh, there aren't other ways to, to do it, but man, I I love the fact that when when I talk to Mark, usually I don't ask him about the two year olds until about April because they're 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 so young and they do so many different things. But in April, you know, I ask him kind of for a, a barometer of where we are, and he can tell me very specifically where horses are in the hierarchy of things, and it's not just. Oh, okay, we'll beat this kind of poorly bred cheap horse that we're hoping to win first time out. I mean, it, it's it's really really well bred horses and, and expensive horses that you would hope would you know have the propensity to, to run well. So I think Joe, that that's that's kind of um, it, it's the old saying that that steel sharpens steel. When when you're when you're training against really good horses in the morning, you have an idea of whether or not they can handle it in the afternoon. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, I was actually looking at the the stats on on Equibase. You guys like shattered your earnings record last year and you didn't bring it up on the show. <laughs> well, I, I, I know, I know you like to think that, that I'm a narcissist, but I am really humble at, at heart, you know, mm -hmm. and, and again, this, this goes back to, you know, why I'm running for the Breeders' Cup because I'm a, I'm a humble guy who wants to do well in the industry. Um, but yeah, we had, we had a very successful year and, and uh, I appreciate you bringing it up because, you know, I, I took on the, the general man manager position three years ago and every year we've successfully gotten, uh, had more and more earnings and, and run in more prestigious races. And I think even Bill Finley complimented us the other day on how well we were doing. So that to me is the ultimate litmus test. If, if Bill likes what we're doing, then, then I appreciate it. Um, but it, it's always a work in progress. And, and, you know, as you guys know, with this industry, these horses are so fragile that you have to uh, try to maximize the opportunity whenever you can. So I'm very thankful that we're doing it the right way. Um, you know, Mark Cassie and his team are doing a phenomenal job and, and hopefully these horses will continue to develop and do well. And, you know, when we're at Saratoga opening opening weekend, um, come on down to the paddock and, and say hello and and uh, see if we can get you into the winter circle. Yeah. Bring the kids. Bring the kitties, too. Say hello to me, too, if Skip hasn't gotten me drunk by then with all <laughs> the drinks he knows me. Um, but, no, it's it's super exciting always to have good two-year-olds in the barn. There's that saying that John didn't say last time that I also won't say, but it's true, man. It's, you can't – it's hard to look forward to the summer at Saratoga more than if you have a, a couple of nice two-year-olds in the barn. So, shout out. To John and Len and Mark Cassie and continued success. I think we're gonna we're gonna throw it to our, our uh, talk with Randy Moss after this commercial. We Randy and I and and the two of us we uh, we we gave it we gave it to him t this week about uh, about his triple crown spacing idea. So uh, I think we'll, we'll get into that after the break. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. Keeneland September sales grads over the weekend included Grade Three Steve Sexton Mile Winner Silver Prospector, Grade Three Honeymoon Winner Cairo Memories, and Grade Two Triple Ben Winner American Theorem. Also, Chris McGrath had Chris McGraw. Sorry, now that I've, I've met him and hung out with him, I have to say his name correctly. He had a story on Sunday about Keeneland September's Book One, obviously the premier book of all the yearling sales. Uh, it's about the, st the statistics and the trends behind the buyer activity in Book One compared to the rest of the sale. 
And, you know, obviously th that's where everybody focuses. There's a ton of great action and you can find horses in the second week at Keeneland. But book one is where everybody congregates. And uh, it's, it's a really interesting story. Talk to Tony Lacey, who was a friend of the show, who was on um, when we had uh, the Keeneland, the live Keeneland show. John, have you ever sold yearlings in book one? I, I assume we have, right? We have. Yeah, we have. And, and you know, the, the, it, it's the place to be seen. It's the place to be seen, uh, not only to have your horses there, because it means that they represent the top, you know, couple hundred horses that are the entire crop. Um, but it's a place to be seen raising your hand in bidding, um, because uh, everyone takes notice when you buy a horse out of book one. Yep, for sure. And that came on September sale now is all, all over three months away. So, so get ready for that starting Monday, September 12th. And we'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Keeneland September Yearling Sale. A terrific maternal pedigree, grade one winners, and champions across the bay. Echo Zoo parties! Life is good! Let's go! A superstar! Go to the back. Good luck. He was just put together like a machine, and he had a great mind. Everything about him was what you'd want. Tis the law, pops the cork in the champagne. Tis the law is going to win the first leg of the Triple Crown. I've never seen him get tired. Respect the law. Tis the law. His structure is just perfect. His bone is perfect. He's left the others behind. He's going to win the run, Happy Travers. He's everything you would look for in a horse. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Coolmore. Sterling Silver is a New York bred daughter of Cupid. Secured her second stakes victory of the year on Monday in the Bowery Stakes at Belmont. Uh, Sterling Silver has won out one of two stakes winners and 32 winners for Cupid just this year. On Sunday, American Pharaoh had two great stakes winners around the world. Grade two Triple Ben winner, American Theorem, who I mentioned earlier at Santa Anita. And then Above the Curve, who won the, great, the Group One Pro Coolmore sponsored. Pre St. Hilary at uh, Longshot. And Coolmore's other Triple Crown hero, Justify, had just his, had, had his first winner before our show last week. And since then, he's added his first TDN rising star when his daughter Statuette won on debut at Nevada. So I expect Justifies to be blowing up all over the world this year, as you would expect. There's going to be, there, there was such demand for his foals. And now that his two year olds are starting to run, I think because Coolmore has such an international footprint, obviously, that happened with American Pharaoh. We saw a bunch of his winners in Europe. So I think that he's going to be a sensation, not just in America, but all across the world. And I honestly, I can't wait to see him. As I teased before the break, we had a great friend of the show, Randy Moss, on this week to talk to him. And it was honestly more of like a, a debate segment than our typical interview because Randy has been, as he would say, the poster child for elongating the triple crown and spacing the races out further. So Bill, John, and I, like a bunch of attack dogs, surrounded him and yelled and barked at him for like a half hour. But no, it was very, it was actually very illuminating and very respectful because Randy's obviously a really smart guy. And it's there's there is debate to be had about about this issue. And so check it out. It's a, it's our interview with uh, and our our little discussion debate with uh, Randy Moss. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. You can learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. So we are thrilled to bring back in the excellent NBC sports analyst and friend of the show, Randy Moss. Thanks for coming on, bro. Hey, good to see you again. We're going to do a very you. nice, gregarious intro before we start yelling at you about the Triple Crown thing. Because... <laughs> You become a bit of a lightning rod for this, I think. You're the you're the guy, the most prominent guy, at least, who is arguing for spacing the triple crown out further. The three of us said we don't want that on last week's show. But before we yell at you, let's hear your case. Well, it's three against one, but I've got Lucy on my side back here as well. So uh, there you go. The no, I've, uh, I've become kind of the poster child for this thing. Only, I think, just because I've been... I've been standing on this soapbox for so long. This goes back 15 years ago, basically, when I was with ESPN. Um, and when people were saying there would never be another Triple Crown winner, and I was saying there not only are there going to be Triple Crown winners, they're going to come in bunches. And at some point, people are going to say that the Triple Crown has become too easy to win because too many good horses are skipping the Preakness because of the two-week gap. So, you know, I've been beating this drum 
for a long, long time. But look, I mean, I, I think it's pretty basic. Um, the Triple Crown is undeniably the number one property, so to speak, in thoroughbred racing. And I think it's incumbent upon the sport to take care of the Triple Crown. And when it sees some weaknesses beginning to develop in the Triple Crown, do something about it to fix it. And right now, it's clear that the, the Preakness has been weakened, demonstrably weakened, not every year, but most years, by the two-week gap and by trainers that believe that it's counterproductive to the best interest of their horses to come back in two weeks, unless you're the Derby winner, they usually come back, except this year. And so I, I think making the Preakness a stronger race will help the Triple Crown it will, won't make the Triple Crown easier to win because the Preakness will be more difficult. I think it'll balance out the, uh, the extra time between the races. And I think it just makes it a better product all in all. And then there's the horse issue as well. Um, you know, I don't believe that yeah, it's, a, it's a huge factor in terms of horse safety or anything like that. But if the trainers believe it's better for their horses to have four weeks or five weeks between races, they believe that for a reason. They believe that because they think it is not in the best interest of the horses physically and in their performance to come back on a two-week gap. So why not take that into consideration as well? It goes a lot deeper than that. I mean, the main argument that I hear against it um, is, is the history of it. Because people say, well, it's always been that way, right? Well, it has always been that way since 1960. 1960 was the year that it changed to the current two-week, three-week format. But it's, you know, in the 1940s, there were four Triple Crown winners, right? Whirlaway, Assault, Count Fleet, Citation. All four of those Triple Crown winners had four weeks between the Preakness and the Belmont Stakes. Uh, in the decade of the 1950s, there were three instances in which there were three weeks between the Derby and the Preakness and six in which there were four weeks between the Preakness and the Belmont. Now, it's not as if this current gap that we've had for the last 62 years was handed down in, in stone tablets or anything like that. The whole idea of the Triple Crown, and I've gone back and looked on newspapers.com for articles in the past about spacing and people, it was never an issue. No one ever talked about it. The, the Triple Crown as, as a concept was to pit the best horses of a generation against each other in three successive races. And the mile and a half of the Belmont as the test of the champion uh, was always the perfect way to end it. And the Derby was, of course, traditionally always a mile and a quarter. But it's, it's the fact that you're running against the best of your generation for three consecutive races and beating them that makes the Triple Crown what it is. Not the, not the spacing necessarily. And we're not getting that right now. In most years, we're not getting, we're not asking, these three-year-olds aren't being asked to run against the best of their generation in the Preakness because 49 horses in the last 10 years have been withheld from the Preakness to wait for the Belmont Stakes. I think it's, I think it's, it's pretty simple and it's pretty obvious that it needs to be fixed. All right, so let's unleash the attack dogs here. Um, let's go, let's go. Randy, I mean, I, I, in some respects, I've come surprised because, you know, I'm on the polar opposite. I, I don't disagree with a whole lot of what you said, but, you know, I, I disagree with some of the ways you want to go, people want to go about this. And there's two things I want to bring up. Um, first of all, you talked, you said the product, the product of the truck. Right. Yep. That, is, that is absolutely huge. You're absolutely right about that is huge. Horse racing is a struggling sport. Um, I think things are only going to get worse because of sports betting and, and other factors out there. Yet the Triple Crown is wildly popular and continues to get more popular every year. So it's not just if it's not broke, don't fix it type thing. I see the difference between the Triple Crown is that your Aunt Millie bets on it. It's not the it's not the suburban handicap. It's not even the Breeders' Cup. It's a race where it appeals to the general public. And is something that, you know, people have Kentucky Derby parties. People follow the Triple Crown. I think if you ch right now it works because it's nice, neat and compact within five weeks. I think if you change the spacing around, the general public is going to lose interest in the Triple Crown, particularly if there's not a horse going uh, for the, the, the Triple Crown in the Belmont. I just don't think, you know, the average man or woman on the street is has enough 
you know, it will invest enough in this to to stay in tune with the triple crown. That's number one. And you know, if you want to come back to some of these, uh, I appreciate. It. Number two is the you know the solution that most people put forth is four weeks, four weeks. I don't know if you're a four weeks, four weeks guy or not, but that's what you hear most. I'm gonna tell you right now, that's not gonna that's not gonna fix anything because the Chad Browns of the world still are not going to run. You cannot, these guys are not going to run a horse three times in eight weeks. Look at Zandon. He ran uh, third in the Kentucky Derby. And, you know, when are we going to see him again in Saratoga? That's the way they handle the, these horses. And if guys do come back in the Preakness on four weeks rest, and they run Derby Preakness, they're not coming back in the Belmont. And so now you're going to ruin the Belmont. So, you know, in order, I think, you know, Joe put it, and, and I think he's right in an earlier podcast, and the only way to guarantee these horses will run everything is have a derby in March, uh, the Preakness in June, and, and the Belmont in September. Short of that, you're not going to get these horses to run. So the problem is not with the way the Triple Crown is faced. The problem is the ridiculous way that people campaign these horses in this day and age. Where, oh, God forbid, I can't run a horse more than four times a year and I need nine, ten weeks in between races. So, you know, that's just some of the points that, that, that I'd like to make. And, you know, if you want to take them and address them. Yeah, I'll take a I'll take a couple of them there. First of all, right now with the five week gap between the Kentucky Derby and the Belmont, if you do not have a Triple Crown winner coming to the Belmont Stakes, the people lose interest. All you have to do is look at the TV ratings. So the five weeks is immaterial when you don't have a horse going for the Triple Crown. If you did have a horse going for the Triple Crown, and now you're talking about an eight week or a nine week gap, I think it would just give even more time for the publicity mill to run. I don't think it would diminish interest in the possibility of a Triple Crown winner one iota. Um, I, I think when you have TV networks constantly promoting it and 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 advertising it, and that, I think the same goes for the gap between the Kentucky Derby and the Preakness. I don't think an extra couple of weeks or three weeks would make any difference at all. Um, as far as your second point, I I'm not married to a four week four week thing. Uh, I know I've heard some people say uh, first Saturday in May, first Saturday in June, first Saturday in July. Um, I know that would solve a lot of the issue with people skipping the Preakness to wait for the Belmont because no one is going to go eight weeks from the Derby to the Belmont without a race in between. Uh, and I don't know that there is. Oh, a I couldn't way... disagree with you more on that. I think they'd salivate at that eight weeks off. So eight eight weeks to into a mile and a half race. From the Derby? Well, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think that's yeah. not even enough time for some of these trainers, to be honest with you. But yeah. whatever. Keep going. I would be I would be fine with five weeks, five weeks, or four weeks, five weeks. Or you know, I I'm not married to any particular thing other than I think we've got to come up with something to try to ensure and maybe bring back a triple crown bonus, if that's even possible. Because right now, I mean, one of the big problems and one of the reasons that it was it was uh it was done away with to be you know in 1993 was the breakdown of Prairie Bayou and the Belmont Stakes. And I think people didn't necessarily believe that that horse, uh, you know, was unfairly entered in the Belmont Stakes, but it raised the whole specter of at least the possibility of someone running an unsound horse in the Belmont in order to try to get the bonus. Today, we've got so much more of an emphasis on pre-race examinations and these horses are now under such a microscope before they run in these major stakes races that I don't think we have to worry about that to the same extent that we did 30 years ago. Uh, so I don't think there would necessarily be, it wouldn't be a bad thing to try to bring back a triple crown participation bonus in some way to try to encourage horsemen to run in all three races or make it easier for them to more attractive for them to run in all three races. So, Randy, are you, um, but, are you giving us are you giving us the exclusive that you're going to put up the the Moss bonus? Is that what you're saying on our show? <laughs> the Triple Crown Moss bonus. Yeah, I, and maybe no companies. I mean, maybe now the the insurance premiums would be too high for that even to be a possibility. You know, right. I've just I've, I've I've thought about it, and I'm just kind of rolling it out there as as at least you know one possible component to try to get more participation. It worked before. Um, I don't know. But yes, I, I do see, Bill, that in some cases, uh, horses would be less likely to run in the Belmont, having run in the Kentucky Derby and the Preakness. Um, I, I don't know if nine weeks from the Derby to the Belmont 
uh, would be in an extra week, five weeks between the Preakness and the Belmont would make a difference in that or not. Maybe not. Possibly not. Um, you know, maybe that might be an, an unintended negative to it. But right now, what we have is is a leaky boat. And I and I don't think that's acceptable. Um, yeah, it, the way I look at it and I'm you know, this is not meant as a criticism to you three at all. But the, the people, a lot of the people that are lining up against this because of tradition and because this is the way that it's always been done are probably the same people that 50 or 60 years ago would have been against night baseball or the people that would have been against the three point shot in basketball or the designated hitter in baseball uh, as being purists and as messing with something that's working and you're, you're, you know, flouting tradition or things like that. To me, if you can make it better, then you try to make it better, especially if it's as important to the sport, I think, as the Triple Crown is. Yeah, and and, and Randy, you bring up some really good points. And and you know, initially when I when I heard when I read your 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 comments, I was falling in that camp of, well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But but thinking about it more, it's broke. Um and and it's not necessarily the triple crown that's broke in my estimation. It's that Horses don't have the ability to run as often as they did. And you brought up some very good historical points about, you know, why the changes have been made and what the results have been. But I remember reading about horses that ran in the Derby in the 30s, 40s and 50s when when Bill was a young pup. And and, you know, they were running in races between the Preakness and the Belmont. I mean, that that's how often they would run. So to me, it looks as an industry, we have to look at. Is it the the triple crown problem as far as not enough spacing? Is it that these horses are getting beat up trying to get points for the Kentucky Derby through this point system now um, as as a problem? Or genetically, is it an issue of hey, these horses just are more fragile than they than than their forefathers were, um, and and therefore they can't you know handle this kind of racing uh, you know as often as they do? I think. The plan that you've proposed as far as the Triple Crown is the easiest one to fix because we can't fix the genetics, at least not overnight. And I don't think the Kentucky Derby is going to change their point system. So is this kind of the, 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 the path of least resistance? I think so. I think so. I, I, I don't think there's any doubt that horses are less durable today. Uh, than their uh, ancestors were. I mean, I remember writing a column when I was in the newspaper business in the uh, early 1990s or the late 1980s, and Woody Stevens was bemoaning the fact that horses were not as durable as they were earlier in his career. He blamed it on the exercise riders getting too heavy. Uh, but yeah, I mean, he was talking about that almost 40 years ago, right? 35 years ago, he was talking about it. And trainers will admit not necessarily publicly because a lot of them train for breeders and they don't necessarily want to go on the record as saying it, but off the record, almost to a man, they'll tell you that they believe horses are less durable. The guys that have been around a while, uh, less durable than they were years and years ago. And maybe this, maybe someone could come up with a better fix for the triple crown. I'm all ears. You know, I love history. I, I hate to see history changed. Uh, but you, you pointed out the way horses used to be trained. Uh, 1950, I think the Triple Crown, excuse me, the three-year-old champion was Hill Prince. That year, there was two weeks between the Derby and the Preakness, and there was four weeks between the Preakness and the Belmont. If I'm not mistaken, Hill Prince ran Derby, Withers, Preakness, Suburban, and Belmont. I mean, I mean, that's, horses just can't, you know, they're not, I don't think they have, they're genetically durable enough. Uh, to do anything like that anymore. And I I just believe however we do it, and to me, I think this is the easiest fix, that something's got to be done. All right. This is the last one. I haven't had my shot at you yet, and you're going to start for making all this abuse. No, but so this is – it's a two-part question because then we'll move on to talking about some actual racing. Um, the, the first part of it is you're a figure guy. And I think that a lot, I, I don't disagree that horses in general are less durable than they used to be. I think that's borne out. But I think a lot of it, a lot of this waiting and waiting and waiting to run your horses is kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy where these trainers are so reliant, especially on the sheet figures and this idea of the bounce theory, that this idea that if this horse runs this career top race, next time out, if you don't give him enough rest, 
he's going to regress. Now, sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't happen. But I think that they've become so rigid in their mind about this. And I would just wonder what your thoughts are about that uh, kind of over-reliance on figures. And then I have a second question. I'll just let you answer that. I think that's a component of it as well. I mean, Bobby Frankel, I I remember sitting in a tack room with Bobby Frankel at Churchill Downs, uh, and he was telling me that he got his theory on the spacing of races from Charlie Whittingham. He learned it from Whittingham that a lot of times more time will enable horses to reach a peak. And if you keep them at that gap between races, they'll stay at that peak longer. Whereas shorter rest would have more horses going sort of up and down in a form cycle. So I I do think that's a component to it. But I can also tell you uh, from having conversations with these guys that they do believe that horses are also less durable today than they were years ago. Yeah, I think that both things can be true. But I think it just it kind of becomes like you're saying, like like a taught doctrine, more so than just an evidence based this horse needs this amount of time off. This horse has this, needs this amount of time off. But my other question is, you know, I think one of the reasons that the Triple Crown works as such as it does is that it, there's so little competition. Like when you had to go back to spend a buck in the mid 80s, for the last horse who was healthy, won the Derby, skipped the Preakness and the Belmont. He did that because there was another option. There was another race to run in. Now there's really nothing on the calendar for those five weeks or even want to broaden it out to seven, eight weeks. Also, you want to run in the mat win. To me, if you space it out even further to where the Belmont, four weeks apart, is the Belmont will be July 2nd. This year, the Haskell is July 23rd. So I think it's 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 kind of foolhardy to think that trainers aren't going to start looking towards the Haskell and the Belmont, or rather in the Travers, and try to find the easiest spot now that it's kind of on the summer calendar instead of running in the Belmont. Do you? What do you think about that? Do you think you're creating maybe more competition for the Triple Crown? I... You know, Joe, to me, the Triple Crown is is so entrenched in in horse racing right now and in and in, uh, you know, the breeding industry with not necessarily the Belmont as far as stallion value. But, you know, I mean, I I, I think it's it, it's so historic and it it's such a it's such a part of of what these trainers and owners want to experience that I don't think it's going to necessarily diminish the desire to run in these races. I mean, that's just my opinion. I have thought about the Haskell. I love the Haskell. And obviously yeah. there would have to be some changes in the summer program at some of these tracks. Um, the Haskell and the Jim Dandy would both be put in a unique position uh, if the Belmont were run, let's say, the first or second week of July. Uh, the Travers would be just fine. But some of the lead-in races to the Travers that we're seeing right now might have to be adjusted or would be compromised, definitely. I agree with that. Yeah. Um, I'm not ready to move on. <laughs> I've been making notes here, and I'll try to keep it quick because I know we do need to move on. Um, that, that horses have changed um, uh, is not, not hogwash. Uh, I've interviewed genetic experts and equine scientists who say, the type of change people are talking about and the durability of horses would take a thousand years to accomplish. You know, we're going back 50 years in a completely different animal. Ironic that Woody Stevens said that about horses aren't as durable when he ran a horse back in five days rest to win the 1982 um, Belmont Six. Imagine if somebody did that today. They, they, they take his license away from him. Woody Stevens is revered as one of the best Hall of Famers ever. Joe, I was going to make that point about that this would ruin the Haskell, and I'm not sure it wouldn't ruin the Travers as well. Um, then one more I want to say, Randy, uh, I'm sure this is probably something you agree with and we can agree on something. I think one of the big problems here is that the purses for the Preakness and Belmont are way too low. In this day and age, there'd be $1.5 million as peanuts. You have dozens and dozens of million dollar races out there. All three races should be worth $5 million each. That would solve a lot of problems whether they're raced in their current uh, stretch or not. Now, having said all that, Randy, the question I want to ask you want to move on is the um, – there was a report in the Baltimore Sun leading up to the Preakness in which you were quoted in there. And the Starnet Group people kind of said, yeah, we're really interested in doing this. They didn't say much more than that. But um, do you think – and so they're the ones that have to make the move. The Derby's not going anywhere. The Belmont will have to react to what Pimlico Maryland Jockey Club does. Um, you know, you're pretty – you know, you've got your ear to ground a lot of sources – do you think after the Belmont Stakes is run, we're going to learn that they have, in fact, said, yeah, we're moving the, the race, uh, this race to whatever date? Do you think it's going to happen? 
Let me address that, and then I want to go back to the first thing you said. Um, I I can tell you for a fact that Churchill Downs Incorporated is strongly behind the concept of spacing out the Triple Crown races uh, to to make the Triple Crown a better product, all three legs a better product, in their opinion. Uh, I know there are people within the Stronic organization. I'm I'm not saying this is a... uh, This is a company decision right now, but there are people within the organization that believe that if they can't come to some sort of agreement with Naira to get this done, that the Preakness should do it unilaterally if Naira doesn't want to cooperate. Um, But we also heard Belinda Stronach go on our air on NBC and say that it's very important to her and to uh, speaking for the organization uh, that they consult everyone involved, not only the owners and trainers, uh, but also their partners in the Triple Crown. So hopefully everybody can get on the same page with this and can come up with something that would uh, that would be in the best interest of everybody. A- as far as the genetics thing, I am not a geneticist. I don't play one on TV. Uh, I never aspire to be a geneticist. All I can tell you is what I've been told by trainers. And clearly, whether it's the way they believe horses are performing better, to Joe's point, or whether it's in the best interest physically of the horses they believe, clearly the way horses are being trained right now is counterproductive to the best horses of the generation running in all three legs. Right. And and Randy, before I ask my question, Bill, I can tell you also that in speaking to geneticists that I've spoken to, they, they agree with your guy that it would take thousands of years for the gene pool to change to the point where horses would physically as a breed would change. I can tell you just anecdotally, and again, talking to other geneticists, that the phenotypes, the way they look physically, these horses are very different than they were 30 or 40 years ago. And yes, the genetics are probably the same. A horse is a horse is a horse, the same as people are people are people, but human beings on average have trended to get taller. And, and, you know, that's just the way that, that it's been. doesn't mean that it helped me at five, six, but it, it's helping the, the, the right. gene pool of the humankind. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to agree to disagree with you on that one. Um, but Randy, let me ask you about the Belmont because that is coming up and that is on the calendar for this year. And it looks like for the Belmont, there's going to be an interesting pool of horses coming in, um, you know, from the Derby winner to nest um, and, uh, and a couple of the horses like Modonical that, that, that skipped the Preakness. What are your feelings about the Belmont? Well, you've obviously got the whole Todd Pletcher angle, the success that he's had in in running Derby Week and skipping the Preakness and waiting for the Belmont. And now with both Mo Donegal and Nest, he's trying to pull that off yet again. Uh, And you got Rich Strike, who had that workout the other day that I thought looked okay. I mean, I've got some friends of mine whose opinion I respect uh, very much who were uh, not impressed at all with the between races workout at Churchill Downs. But I looked at the video. I mean, what? What the hell do I know? I mean, he looked okay to me. Uh, but So he's, you know, he'll be there. But to me, looking at the race on paper, uh, depending on exactly which of the fringe contenders go in there and which don't, we could be in a situation here where the Peter Pan winner, we the people, uh, could once again just completely be in control of the early pace. And to me, unless any of these other speed horses long shot speed horses like Howling Time, for example, Dale Romans, decide to jump in there. Uh, he's going to be he's going to be very tough for these one, uh, you know, these one run closers like Mo Donegal and Rich Strike uh, to catch if they give him that kind of an advantage. I'm all over with the people in the Belmont. I don't care how short of a price he is. I'll single him if he's too short of a price. I totally agree. I think he's long gone in that race. Um, You know, let's talk a little bit about the three-year-olds overarching in an overarching way because, you know, I was looking at the past, like, decade or so of American champion three-year-olds. but And, you know, a lot of them ran in the Derby and the Preakness, but you got some other ones that came on late in the year, like West Coast and Arrogate. And if you want to go back to Will Take Charge, I think this year in particular, it's more likely that somebody who hasn't run in either the Derby or the Preakness is going to be champion three-year-old, whether you talk about Jack Christopher or We the People – how do you feel about that? Do you think you still think it's a strong group of three year olds that we saw in the Derby of the Preakness, or do you feel like I do that? You know, the second half of the year, three year olds are really going to rule the day. Hey, it's going to be very interesting, Joe. I mean, to me, right now, and I know it, it 
kind of flies in the face of the triple crown results to a certain extent. But I think Epicenter right now of the three year olds that we've seen is is still the best. Uh, I thought given the pace, but the pace really made this triple crown so far, the Derby and the Preakness, very, very interesting as it pertains specifically to Epicenter. Going into the Kentucky Derby, his pace numbers from Louisiana were so slow that I thought that the biggest challenge he faced was would he be able to handle a scenario in which he was farther back than he was accustomed to being? Not like the Louisiana Derby where he's sitting third, but I'm talking about where he wound up, like eight, six lengths back. But you do the pace numbers, and even being six lengths back in the Kentucky Derby at the first call, he ran way faster early than he had yeah. ever been asked to run before. And I think it did take a little wind out of his sails in the in the final quarter of a mile. And from that perspective, I think he was probably the best horse in the race. Okay. He fought off Zandon. Um I, I thought Epicenter was the best. Now you move forward two weeks later to the Preakness and I don't know what the hell was going on. Whether it was uh Rosario being too uh being too timid at the start of the race, not being aggressive enough, whether it was the fact that the horse maybe broke a beat slowly, which I think he did a little, whether he got squeezed back enough as a result to make that much of a difference, whether maybe the two weeks he just didn't have the same fastball that he had. But he ran, he was farther back after a quarter mile in the Preakness than he was after a quarter mile in the Kentucky Derby. And the difference in the pace for those two races was enormous. I mean, he had no, he had literally no chance pace wise from where he was early in the Preakness. And yet he still almost caught early voting or he came within a length and a quarter or so of catching him. So I thought he was clearly the best horse in the Preakness. Now we'll see going forward. Um, if he improves, as a lot of three-year-olds do later on in their three-year-old season, or if he's going to sort of keep that same plane, uh, unless he improves, then I think you're right. I think you could get some of these horses like uh, like Jack Christopher, and who knows, maybe we the people that could uh, that could jump up and surpass him. So I've been listening to you guys, and you know I've, I'm I'm one over. These horses are so weak, so frail. I'm going to think you guys haven't gone far enough. I'm going to change this just because they, these horses, I mean, man, they do <laughs> poor things. I mean, you run them four times a year and they just fall apart. <laughs> Let's make the Derby six furlongs, the Preakness seven furlongs, and the Belmont a mile. And I got the new slogan for the Derby, the most exciting 68 seconds in sport. <laughs> Does that work for everybody? Okay. Enough being a wise ass. One more question for me. <laughs> um, outside of the Triple Crown, you know, we're watching every week and – uh, there's something going on here, and it's been a, a problem that's been brewing for a couple of years, but I think it's, it's hit a tipping point to where it's it, it's a huge problem. It seems like every damn stakes race in the country now has five horses in it, four horses in it. Um, you know, uh, in it's Santa Anita especially, but I wouldn't just pick on them. Naira's had problems. Uh, something need, Do you agree that something needs to be done about this? And if so, what is it? I do. I ab absolutely do. And I have no earthly idea what needs to be done other than the obvious, which is never going to happen. And that's racetracks all right. get together and come up with a stakes calendar that, that makes you know, a logical progression at, at certain levels in certain areas of the country. And you and I both know that uh, that's not going to happen uh, or a league office that can set a schedule. That's never going to happen. So I have no, uh, you know, I totally agree with you. I, I think it's a big problem right now. Competitively, from a betting standpoint, uh, a bottom line standpoint for racetracks. Uh, and I have no solution for it. Do you? No, no. Like you said, the only solution is to get everybody in the room and, you know, eliminate a lot of stakes races. And you're right. There's, you know, it's like, well, we need a commissioner. Of course, you need a commissioner, but it's never going to happen. No. So, but um, it's, it's, I, I mean, it, it's getting bad. It's really getting bad. I mean, right now, the stakes race always used to be the eighth or ninth race on the card. Every, now it's everybody's fourth race right. because they don't want it in the pick, whatever, you know, at, with a one to five favorite in there. And, uh, you know, that goes back it's, to what you were saying before about putting the best product forward. You were talking about that for the Triple Crown, but, you know, that same sort of thinking, how does racing put the best product forward for, you know, every single day of every single week, particularly with, with stakes racing? And, you know, uh, yeah, uh, you're right. I mean, there's no solution. It's just but it's uh, uh, I mean, I'd love to see some statistics at the end of the year. This is, it, it's 
it's it's a huge problem. Well, the other solution would be less racing in general because um, there are fewer horses right now than there were, obviously. Um, and, you know, you can definitely make the case, which people have for a long time, that right now there's too much of a good thing. Racetracks are running too many dates, running too many stakes races. Uh, and maybe it is less is more in a situation like this. But again, you know, try try convincing first racing uh, not to run year round at Gulfstream Park or, right. you know, it's it's easier said than done. Exactly. Or try to convince the breeders that we should get rid of stake races when that's the lifeblood sure. of, of yeah. their commercial breeding program. Well, that, that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen either. And Randy, I, I have to apologize for Bill because he's even more of a curmudgeon than he usually is. Because somebody <laughs> wrote an op-ed piece, you know, that that said that basically he was being a jerk. So he, 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 right. he broke up on the wrong side of the bed. I apologize. Right. Um, I'm going to ask you a non-racing question since since okay. you're you're uh, a man of, of all sports. What did you think of the NFL draft, and who ended up with the best uh, the best uh, you know group of rookies? That's interesting, Jonathan. Um... You know, I'm a big fan of, as an organization, of the Baltimore Ravens. And I have I always, you know, always kind of look extra hard at what they do, even without Ozzie Newsom. I think they've done a fantastic job. The Jets, ironically, to me, look like they had, there you go, Joe, had, uh, had one of, if not the best draft of all, right? I mean, Joe Douglas did a fantastic job. I thought the Jets really knocked it out of the park. Now, whether that's going to translate to, more than their customary two or three wins a season, we'll see. But uh, I love the way they, you know, what they did. Yeah, well, I mean, that's this is our this is our time right now as Jet fans. The off season is this is <laughs> off season champions. Hang that banner again. Um, all right, Randy. I guess we'll let you go after we yelled at you for a half oh, hour. Thank no, you so no, much no. for Randy the time, smart, Randy. Hey, Bill can be a curmudgeon. What's up? Bill can be a curmudgeon all he wants. Bill and I go back a long, long, long way in the sport. So. Uh, we, we've had these conversations, and then we'll continue to have them. All right. Thank you, yes, sir. That's, that's why you're the best. We'll see you at the Belmont. All right, guys. Take care. Thanks, man. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by the Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, Randy Moss, will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more at greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from the Green Group. Why do the most successful owners, breeders, and horsemen select the Green Group as their tax advisor? We simply save them money and know how to make them more successful. Over the past 40 years, founder Leonard Green has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport. His in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with cutting-edge tax-saving strategies, has produced positive results for his clientele and has made the Green Group the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the business. For a confidential and complimentary consultation, contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. The PA Horse Breeders Association introduces the Pennsylvania Stallion Series. Four brand new races to be run at parks for PA sired, PA bred two year olds. There are two $100,000 contests on August 22nd, PA Day at the Races. September 24th, PA Derby Day has two more races, each with a $200,000 purse. The PA Stallion Series, yet another reason why Pennsylvania is the premier place to breed and race. For more, please visit pabred.com. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Horse Breeders Association. Looking forward to the first running of the PHBA's two-year-old PA Sired, PA Bred Stallion Series. Two of the seven $100,000 PA Bred Stakes will be on their annual Million Dollar PA Day at the Races card, which is August 22nd at Parks. Early nominations for those races close on July 11th, so definitely keep this series in mind as you're planning your summer racing schedule, especially if you have PA Breds. And 17 PA Breds, this is a nugget from John, are going to be in the OBS June sale, which comes up next week. Um, so definitely, obviously, a great program to get involved in, in the PA Bred, PA Sired program. So the Pennsylvania Horse Breeders definitely expanding the, the opportunities um, for owners owners and trainers of PA Bred. So definitely get involved if you see one that you like at OBS June. A little bit of a slow news week this week. And that's why we gave John the opportunity in segment one to talk about how great DJ Stable is doing, which is true. You know, we, we didn't we didn't make that up. Um, but also, I thought th this was an interesting story for a slow news week. Bill had a great op ed in this in this week's TD and uh, this week, one of this weekend's TDNs. And it's honestly something that I've been saying for a long time. I felt like I was kind of moving the pen for Bill as he was writing this, you know, the spirit of Joe Bianca, because this is something I've talked about for a while. 
about the Met Mile kind of needing to be on Memorial Day and how it's such a big race in New York and it just gets lost on the Belmont undercard. And, you know, Bill acknowledged it in the story about why these tracks want these blockbuster cards. He said last year's handle for the Belmont Stakes card was $112 million, which is a record for a non <clears throat> triple crown year. But I'm quoting now. And he said, but there's been a price to pay. The weekend racing leading up to and following the Belmont has absolutely no sizzle. That might be fine for some of the weeks, but it shouldn't be okay for Memorial Day. You can make a case that the Met is the third most important, most prestigious race run each year in New York behind only the Travers and the Belmont. Put it alongside eight claiming races if you have to, and it can carry a day. But on Belmont Day, it tends to get lost. Could not agree with that more. I would argue, honestly, when the Belmont, there isn't a triple crown up for grabs. It's right up there with the with the Belmont and the Travers. I honestly would not put it behind those two races, especially not the Belmont, if there's no triple crown. It is, and, and especially in the world of of stallions and you know horses becoming so valuable for what they can do after they finish their racing career. The Met Mile is so important. It just it it, it and it takes all of those route horses and those sprint horses and kind of condenses them down into one field. You usually get a big field. This year's Met looks like it's going to be appointment viewing even more so than the Belmont or any of those races on the card. And like Bill said in his story, I don't think you would honestly miss it if you took it off the Belmont card because you're still going to have six or seven grade ones. The Met Mile made Memorial Day special at the track. And no disrespect to the New York Reds, it's a great it's a great program and actually a really good card, usually a good betting card to have the New York Reds show, showcase day. But just in terms of cachet and in terms of attention paid to Belmont on Memorial Day, nothing compares to the Met Mile. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I mean, you summarize a lot of what I said in there and a couple of points. Um, the you don't even have to take don't take the New York Red Day away from Memorial Day. Just add the Met Mile to it. And, you know, it, it kind of just jumped up. I mean, this has been going on since 2014 when they first moved it to a Saturday. And, and I think, Joe, you and I and, and perhaps John as well were in agreement right from the start. I didn't like the idea. But what was kind of sort of jarring this year was. Basically, the whole Memorial Day weekend at Belmont came and went with nothing, absolutely nothing. I know the New York Red people can get mad at me for saying that, but, you know, a bunch of New York Red races does not compare to a, a card highlighted by a, a, a million dollar grade one race. I say it's the third most important race in New York. You say it might even be better. So, you know, you had one graded stakes race over the entire weekend, which is soaring softly on Saturday. Now, I don't disagree with what Naira and every other track pretty much has done to create these blockbuster days. They do work. There's no doubt about it. But as I said in the story, and as you said um, as well, take the Met Mile out of Belmont Stakes Day, and Belmont Stakes Day is not going to lose a penny in handle, not a penny, because it's still going to be a great day. You put it back to Memorial Day, and you create an event out of Memorial Day where now it's just like a block on a card. So, you know, would, would Naira consider doing this? I have no idea. But, you know, it, it's kind of from there's two problems here. First of all, you know, Memorial Day weekend comes and goes without anything to get excited about. And, yeah, um, you know, even though you say it, it and you know what, the horse is lining up for it this year. It will be a better race than the Belmont. It will, for guys like us, we will look forward to the Met Mile more, frankly, than the Belmont Stakes. But it's still, for the general public and everybody else, it's Belmont Day. It gets lost. And it deserves to have a day of its own. So much so, guys, that, you know, the past two shows, we haven't really even been talking very much about some of these graded stake races. I mean, Joe, this morning... You know, you, you kind of glossed over the fact that there were a couple of graded stake races, you know, and, and I wouldn't even have known it unless I was, a, you know, doing the show. I wouldn't have, have even paid attention to it at all. Um, the story softly, the only graded stake race on Memorial Day weekend, uh, you know, at Belmont, it's, it's crazy. And we talk all the time about, you know, the grading system and how, you know, certain races don't deserve to be grade ones or grade twos or, or, or even graded, you know, grade three stake races. The Met Mile... You know, when when you look historically at who's in that race, not only does it deserve to be a grade one, but it, it really is from a breeder standpoint, it is the gateway to stand, to becoming a stallion. When you look at the winners or, or even horses that placed in the race, you know, over the past couple of years, Vacoma, Matoli, McKenzie, uh, you know, uh, Sharp Azteca, uh, Frosted, Upstart, Honor Code, Tonalist, uh, the list kind of goes on and on and on. And those are horses that are standing a stud in Kentucky. Um, and a lot of them are up and coming stallions as well. So, you know, the, the, the industry as a whole 
wants to see the Met Mile showcased. And if you made that on Memorial Day weekend and you had the field that's going to go in there right now, where, where Aloha West and Jackie's Warrior, um, Speaker's Corner, Flight Line, I mean, you're telling me that that wouldn't get the kind of viewership and, and attention from guys like us um, to talk about? I mean, that would probably be segment one and two for the yeah. past two shows quite frankly, would be, you know, the, the pre-race and then the and then the post-race analysis of it. It, it. it is tantamount to, you know, the Derby, the Preakness and some of these other races that we take, you know, most of the show talking about. So I really feel like that, you know, like you said, Bill, the industry is trending towards get all these great stake races and make it a superstar day. But this could be a standalone race on its own. And, and if you wanted to couple it with the New York Red Race, you know, day, that's fine. You can still have that same kind of theme. I think it would only anchor that kind of a day and make it that much better and that much more noticeable for people to, to watch the New York Red races then. And then it's really a win-win across multiple sectors of the industry. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point is that it could draw more eyes to the New York Reds and New York Red stakes if you ran those as supporting stakes for the Met Mile. And listen, the Met Mile gets one of the best fields in racing every single year. Have you ever remembered a Met Mile field that was like, meh? Not that interesting. You at least usually have a couple of really interesting horses in there. And in a, a, a landscape where we have so many grade ones that are just like, they'll put you to sleep. The Met Mile is always exciting. If anything, if we had a grade one plus in the rating system, I think that that's what the Met Mile should be. That's how important it is. And that's how good the horses are that show up every year to that race. And it was a little navel, it was a little navel gazing segment for me because I'm a New Yorker, and but my pops and I used to, we used to go out to to the Memorial Day the Memorial Day card every year at Belmont to watch the Met Mile. We haven't been in and since they they moved it to Belmont Day. And let's be real, all those Grade Ones on Belmont Day they're all terrific races, but those are all undercard races. Those aren't races that you look forward to for months or even weeks. The Met Mile we've been talking about forever since we we heard that Flight Line was going there. You know, that's the, that's the kind of marquee race that gets racing fans excited. And it just, it, I've said this since the beginning, it can't just be another undercard appetizer to the Belmont. It's too important. It's too important to New York racing. It's too important to American racing. It's too important to the breeding and stallion, uh, you know, industry. It's just a race that deserves its own day. And, and Bill, couldn't I couldn't have said it any better than you did in, in your piece. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by XBTV. This week's XBTV Workout of the Week features Beyond Brilliant, who went four furlongs in Santa Anita in 49 and 3. Trained by John Sheriffs, the four year old Colt won the, the Grade 2 Charlie Whittingham in his last start, up and comer in the turf divisi division. And we were just talking about the Met Mile. You can go check out Flight Line on XBTV. He's obviously always a big draw, even when he's just working out. Flavian Pratt traveled across the country to ride him. So it's, he's. he's Honestly, one of the most exciting horses in training in the last, what, five years. But you can check out all the contenders for the Belmont, for the Met Mile, for that huge undercard. XBTV will have a bunch of those workouts on their website. You can just go on XBTV.com and type in the search bar. You can almost always find any big grade one type of horse breezing at, at their home base. So check that out. And we'll be right back after this message from XBTV. All the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you West Point Thoroughbreds. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. You can learn more at westpointtb.com. Congratulations to West Point. They had two winners over the past weekend. Divine Armor 
one at Santa Anita on Friday, and then on Sunday, Voodoo Zip, one at Belmont for Christophe Clement. And Flightline, as I mentioned, the XBTV bit, put in a work on Monday at Santa Anita to pre- prepare for the Met Mile with Flavian Fr- Pratt aboard. So like I said, you can go check that out on XBTV.com. And I know all the West Point partners, even if you're not specifically involved in Flightline, I know that you've been counting down the days to see Flightline race again. We all can't wait for it. And, you know, it's, it's gotten to the point where the hype is is so gigantic that you don't you don't know how he could possibly live up to it. But from what he's done so far, I would not put it past him. So we can't wait. That's going to be next Saturday. We're 10 days away from Belmont Stakes Day. And, you know, like we were just saying in the last segment, put Flightline on Memorial Day. Give him his own day. That's all I'll say, buddy. Well, is it a time now for trainers behaving badly? The segment that we seem we got to get a sponsor for that, by the way, and some theme music too. But um, be, uh, Chico, nice. Chico's bail bonds, yeah, right, yeah exactly, right from um, the Bad News Bears. <laughs> very, very good, well, John. Um, so I, I thought it was interesting because the you know we get all these uh, drug positives or medication violations, and they're ninety nine point nine percent of the time they're the same thing: a therapeutic medication and overage, like Brad Cox got with with. Uh, Butte the other day. And, you know, not that anybody should be getting these, but in the grand scheme of things, they don't mean a hill of beans. So uh, it's so rare to see a trainer really pop for doing something that is, you know, above and be well above and beyond the, the, you know, Banamine Butte overages. And a trainer by the name of Robert Girl, G-E-R-L, was suspended and was announced on uh, uh, Tuesday 20 years and fined $100,000 up in Canada for using a drug called Osterine, which is essentially, from what I can tell, it, it's not steroids, but acts like steroids. Now, uh, first of all, it, it's you know good for the Ontario, uh, what is it, the alcohol and whatever, it's some weird name. Alcohol and gaming commission. Yeah. yeah. They did it good for them for going after this guy. Um, essentially, I don't know how old he is, but his career's over. I mean, he's not gonna come back in 20 years from now. Um, so it's good to see, you wonder why this doesn't happen more often. Um, couple other points and that one I'm going to kind of say tongue in cheek. The horses were named Arafat and Communist. Whoever named the horses should have also gotten 20 years for, for that as well. But do you guys ever notice that every time they get one of these, a trainer on these, you know, very serious charges, it's always a guy who doesn't ever win any races. It's never anybody think, oh, that we know that guy's cheating and they finally caught him. This poor guy was 0 for 25 in 2021 and 0 for 25 in 2020. Uh, I guess, you know, allegedly, I guess he wasn't even good at ch- cheating. So, you know, um, but it was it, it's an interesting story be- to me because even though it's a low profile guy, you just never see this. We, we caught a guy red handed doing something really serious. And, you know, good for them not giving him a one year suspension. Basically said goodbye, fella. You know, go- good luck with the rest of your life. You're out of horse racing for good. Well, I love how you say that that his career is, is over. I don't know if his career ever started based on those stats. Yep. I don't, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't know that there was – yeah, it, it's – you know, there was a guy like this at, a, at Gulfstream a little while ago, Alfredo Lacoa, I think his name was, and he got busted for some serious stuff, and he was winning at like 7%. I mean, it just goes to show you, honestly, the guys that, you know, frankly are dumb enough to get caught – are not the yeah. ones who are who are the problem and cheating the game, you know, in a meaningful way. You know, and I, I anybody that's that's cheating, I think, deserves to get banned. But now it's basically just this guy and Rick Dutrow. Those are the only people that we've ever meaningfully suspended for a long time. You know, and that kind of reminded me of a of a story that Peter Miller's starting to run horses again. Um, he's he's starting to run horses this week. You know, he had this this self imposed quote unquote six month hiatus from training last year we just he sent all of his his uh horses to ruben alvarado who was one of his assistants and you know it's kind of been business as usual it seems like ruben alvarado has been winning a bunch of races in california including some stakes races and you know it, it, it there were the circumstances around his departure were very very vague and you know suspicious honestly because you know aiden butler has been doing this stuff at santa anita where he just kicked richard baltus's ass out of here and, you know, Peter Miller swore up and down that the reason he was going away was just to take a break. And there was, you know, there was no investigation or anything like that. But when you come back at like six months on the dot, to me, that suggests otherwise. To me, that su- su- suggests that there was a soft ban of some kind in place there. And, you know, there was there was uh, th- th- there was some consternation and some discussion about his horses 
dying at a more frequent rate in the previous year from before he left and, you know, whether or not that that was part of the case. But I wonder, you know, Aiden Butler is the kind of guy, seems like he's not afraid of a headline. You know, he's not afraid to, to grab a big name and, and by the scruff and throw him out of the track or at least suspend him a little bit. Like, that's kind of what he's doing with Richard Baltus right now. And you can agree or disagree with that, you know, with that approach. I think overall it's better to have some, you know, some actual sheriffs on the beat with some with some teeth and the things they do. But I just this this whole situation with Peter Miller really confused me because why not make a big stink? Why not, you know, put another scalp on the wall if Peter Miller is a guy that you think is cheating and you think you need to, you know, to get rid of ASAP? Like why why was this so secret, Bill? I wonder. Well, that's a very good question, Joe. And um when this thing about Miller came out, I texted Aiden um Butler and uh, what is it, 10, 11 days ago, I still haven't gotten any response from him whatsoever. I don't quite understand that. But you said that the circumstances of Miller leaving were vague. The circumstances of his return are vague as well. Now, you know, the whole thing that he said about, oh, I'm just going to go take a break to spend time with my family, you know, it didn't pass the smell test when it happened. And now it really doesn't pass the smell test with the timing of this. It appears, from what I can tell, is that he is banned at Santa Anita right. by house rules, but is not banned at Del Mar and Los Alamitos, which is the same thing Jerry Hollendorfer is going through. So his stable is returning. He announces his return as the Santa Anita meet is, is getting to the finish line. And then he can race Los Al. You know, that's only, what, seven, eight days of race. And it's not a big deal. But then he can race at Del Mar. Now, what is his status once Santa Anita reopens? I mean, it. it I assume... He has been banned by Santa Anita, but that's just an assumption because they have not said word one about what's going on here. So, you know, this story has more legs. What's going to happen uh, beyond the Del Mar meet? Will, will it just be that the horses run under uh, the assistant trainer's name at Santa Anita and run under Peter Miller's name at, um, at Del Mar and Los Alamitos? And I see you're shaking your head as you, you, you well should. Perhaps that is what's going to happen here. Um, but yeah, I mean, sort of. Good, they they've done a lot of really good things, and um, yeah, they they should be patting themselves publicly on the back. They haven't said anything about Baltus either. Um, you know, I, I, I've I've also tried to get some information on that and have gotten no answers. Well, it's such a fascinating thing too because Santa Anita has such a problem with field size. So this has got to be a, a little bit of a, a dilemma here. And we've talked about this in the past about how, you know, a lot of a lot of racing offices, and I think a lot of people run racetracks have been, you know, have, have let things slide a little bit over the years for guys who fill stalls. You know, the Jorge Navarro's and, and Jason Services of the world. I'm not saying these guys are necessarily them, but I don't know that they are not either. I, I think that, you know, it's it's honestly brave to go after these guys who fill stalls at a track where you have five and six horse fields. In every single stakes race, and I wonder if there's kind of a long game involved here, an idea that you know, if we do get rid of guys that you know there are whispers about and that people think are cheating, maybe some like some honest trainers will come and feel more comfortable running at Santa Anita without those guys in the entry box. I don't know. I'm just speculating, but but it's a really interesting you know kind of dual approach where you're trying to increase field size but you're also getting rid of guys who are some of the most prominent trainers on your backside. So I, you know, I, that's a little bit of a, a, a conundrum for me, it seems like. The TDN Writers Room was brought to you by Legacy Bloodstock. Legacy grads have now earned $3.15 million this year with 80 winners of 101 races. We'll see Legacy sales soon with the kickoff of the summer yearling sale at the Basic Tipton July sale, which starts July 12th. We'll be right back after this message from Legacy Bloodstock. Being a small family business, I guess we're part of a dying breed. We're really grateful for the people that entrust us. We know it's a huge responsibility. We're always with your horse every step of the way. When it comes to being at the sales ground, showing your horses, we are with your horse. Just driving up down the road every day, there's not a time that I don't look out and feel a responsibility to the sport, the animal, the people that come to invest in the game. I want to see as many people enjoy this sport as they possibly can because we do have the most beautiful sport in the world. This week's Remy cartoon, we got a horse in the ring that's causing a little bit of trouble. And the auctioneer says, we now present to you this well-bred, good-looking, fourth-generation pain in the ass. And I've seen that before. I've seen horses 
really start being rambunctious and, and give the handlers a lot of trouble in the auction ring. But those handlers do a good ass job, John, don't they? Oh, they really do. And, and you know, fourth generation uh, pain in the ass can describe not only that horse, but a lot of people in the horse business as well. All right. So that's going to do it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. Make plans to attend the Keeneland September yearling sale beginning Monday, September 12th. You can learn more at the world's yearling sale. Com. I want to thank Bill Finley, John Green, our Green Group Guest of the Week, Randy Moss, our producer, Patty Wolf, our associate producer, Katie Petruniak, and our editors, Anthony LaRocca, Aliyah LaRocca, Nathan Wilkinson. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next week.